Well, it's a great pleasure to be here talking to you in Leipzig. I wish I was with you in person, but this is the next best. Um, and I've been asked to talk really about slow science, and so I'm going to focus on productivity and reproducibility and the question of how far they are conflicting pressures on scientists. I want to start by emphasising the cumulative nature of science, or at least this is how science is intended to be, um, way back with Isaac Newton saying if he'd seen further it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, the idea that we build on what has gone before, um, we don't sort of suddenly discover something out of nowhere, and so we try to have a science that is cumulative. More and more when I give talks on this sort of topic, what I get are early career researchers who are telling me how this has not worked for them. They've set out to try and do a PhD or a postdoc project, um, taking as a starting point some kind of already um, well-established finding, only to find that it doesn't seem to work in their hands. And of course they initially think it's because they've done something wrong, because they're inexperienced, only to find later on that other people are having the same problem and that there's something wrong with the literature. And this is pretty devastating. It can waste several years of somebody's life. But it's also incredibly important if we want our science to be useful for society. We just don't want it to be wrong. And I think one could say that the COVID situation has really put this into sharp relief. We just can't afford to have wrong findings out there. But in practice, things do go wrong all the time. And rather than, there is a literature on this and, and quite trying to quantify it, but rather than give you just dry statistics, I'm going to give you a concrete example um, and then discuss how it is that this did go wrong. So in 2019, this paper by Border and colleagues um, was published and it made quite a big splash in the literature on genetics of depression because they studied some very large samples, more than one enormous, one was a biobank sample, um, and could find no support for the idea that there was an association between uh, serotonin-related genes and depression, despite the fact that this had been a very popular and apparently uh, well-substantiated theory that had been around for some years. The um, article attracted the attention of uh, Scott Alexander, which is a pseudonym for a blogger who writes very well in this area and who sort of summarised it in some detail in his blog, but then concludes with a sort of heartfelt plea, which is that he says, what bothers me isn't just that people said 5-HTTLPR, which is the gene, uh, mattered and it didn't. It's that we built whole imaginary edifices, whole castles in the air on top of the idea of this gene mattering. We figured out how it exerted it, its effects, what parts of the brain it was active in, what sorts of things it interacted with, how its effects were enhanced or suppressed by the effects of other imaginary depression genes. This isn't just an explorer coming back from the Orient and claiming there are unicorns there. It's the explorer describing the life cycle of unicorns, what unicorns eat all the different subspecies of unicorn, which cuttings of unicorn meet a tastiest and a blow-by-blow -blow account of a wrestling match between unicorns and Bigfoot. Um, and uh, that's pretty damning, but the question really is, how did this happen? Science is supposed to be self-correcting. How is it that over a period of, say, 30 years, we had all these papers that seemed to be supporting the idea of an association between these genes and depression? Why did it take so long? Well, I'm going to go through a number of reasons why it does take so long, and then try and consider, could we have shortened this cycle? I mean, maybe it's just inevitable that in science you go down a wrong path and then you come back, and you could argue this has now corrected itself. <clears throat> but it is a huge amount of time and effort um, devoted to something that turned out to be wrong. And of course, it, it's very devastating for those who have set in to have a career investigating this. <clears throat> now the first reason, which is what I'm calling here is quasi-cumulative science, where instead of it being cumulative as it should, we get this picture as of consistent support for a hypothesis when the reality is actually either mixed or even negative. And the first reason, which is a well-known one, is that we have publication bias in the system. And this has been known about since the 1970s, if not earlier, 
the idea that we only really publish things that look exciting, interesting and typically positive. Uh, this was coined the file draw problem in 1979 by Rosenthal with this image of every researcher having a file draw full of unpublished findings that they don't bother to try and publish because they're not interesting, usually because they're null, or journals will refuse to publish them. And Greenwald, even earlier, talked about prejudice against the null and said that as it's functioning in at least some areas of behavioural science research, the research publication system may be regarded as a device for systematically generating and propagating anecdotal information. Very damning. But how common is it in practice? There's a nice study here that looked at it in the field of depression, treatments for depression, um, and it was able to do so because there are trial registries for intervention studies. So when you have decided to set out to do a study, you have to register what it is you're going to do. And this means that in this study, they were able to look in the trial registries and identify all the studies that were registered and then consider how many got published. And in this slide, um, green blobs represent uh, studies that had a positive result and red blobs studies that didn't. And what you can see is about half the red blobs don't get published. So that's study publication bias. Virtually all the green blobs do get published. We have this preference for positive effects. On top of that, we have something called outcome reporting bias, and I'll be talking later about p-hacking. This is a form of p-hacking where you measure a lot of different possible outcomes, but you say in advance this is the one you're going to use to evaluate your treatment, but then you switch it to another one um, that looks better uh, in terms of the results. So it's not uncommon, and the interesting thing is in the field of clinical trials, we can look at this because we can go into registries and see what was registered. But most studies in most other areas are not registered. And so studies that have null results, we just don't know how many there are. They just sort of disappear off into the void. Is there a cure for this? I'm going to try and talk about solutions as I go through. Um, one possible solution is uh, a phenomenon known as registered reports. Um, this had been mooted way back in the 1970s as an idea um, by a guy called Michael Mahoney, but it never he never sort of implemented it. Chris Chambers remarkably did get it to happen, uh, first in a journal that he was an editor for called Cortex, and then subsequently he has put in a lot of effort encouraging other journals to take up this format, which he's very dedicated to. How does it work? Well, if you compare it with classic publishing, in classic publishing you just go through the sequence of you plan a study, you do it, you then submit it to a journal, and you typically, at that point, you might get it rejected or often request for revisions but you go around this loop a bit with reviewers and ultimately hopefully it's accepted and you publish it. The only difference really with registered reports is at the point at which the uh, article is reviewed and indeed accepted um, which is before you've done the study. So what you submit for publication is your protocol, your analysis plan and if you've got a sensible research question and a well-powered study that has a sensible analysis plan uh, and the reviewers like it, um, it will get accepted in principle and published, guaranteed publication, provided you do what you said you were going to do. And registered reports are really a very useful um, way of overcoming publication bias, not just publication bias, but other forms of bias such as uh, p-hacking, which I'll, I'll be coming on to. But it's, it's really... The decision is whether an interesting question has been addressed with a strong methodology rather than on the results. There's another sort of bias, though, that, that uh, this isn't really going to fix. So registered reports, I think, are great for fixing most of the problems that we have, but not citation bias, which is another um, bias that I've got increasingly interested in as a way of sort of really solidifying wrong findings and giving us a sense that they are true. And this was also covered in this nice study by de Vries. They went on to look beyond outcome reporting bias. They then looked at spin, which happens when somebody describing a study makes it sound as if it found a positive result when it actually didn't. So spin uh, was applied often to null results. And then the last step, though, the killer, really, is citation bias. In this final uh, column, the size of these blobs reflects the number of citations to the work. And you can see that the poor little red blobs, which have survived everything, they've managed to get published despite being negative, they've not been spun, 
not had biased reporting, but they then just get forgotten. There's tiny, tiny little red blobs compared to the big green blobs. We don't cite or process even findings that don't go in line with our um, predictions and our preconceptions. There's another nice example of this here from Greenberg, which was more a single case study of a particular um, theory in the literature that maintained that uh, beta amyloid um, was produced by and injures the skeletal muscle of patients with a condition called inclusion body myositis. And he just identified all the papers that were on this topic and then the network of paths between them. And what is noteworthy is that this little cluster uh, of papers on the bottom left of the chart, those six papers, um, which had critical data in them, only one of them ever gets cited. Um, whereas the studies that seem to support the theory get lots and lots of citations. And so he has this nice way of putting it that citation can be used to generate information cascades resulting in unfounded authority of claims. Why does this happen? Well, it's often not deliberate. It can be actually quite hard to process and to remember information um, that doesn't agree with our expectations and our viewpoint. And to some extent, that's a human cognitive failing. But to another extent, in many aspects of life, if you're not trying to do science, it's not a bad idea to have a sort of bias towards things that are relevant to you. But in practice, in science, it's a disaster. Um, how can we get around it? Um, the whole purpose of the idea of a systematic review was developed in clinical medicine, um, in the clinical trials literature, um, as a way of trying to ensure that people looked for and processed and evaluated all the literature, not just a subset that they happened to like. Um, there is a view that this should be part of, of graduate training in other areas as well. It should be just sort of a mandatory part of what you learn to do and possibly required before you embark on a study of your own. It has been difficult uh, in areas outside clinical trials um, to work out how to do systematic reviews because the literature is much more messy, uh, there's, the questions are often variable, um, and I can recommend these Nero guidelines um, which were developed. Um, I had a small part in this, but it's, it's by uh, Jade Pickering and Marta Topol um, to try and provide good guidelines for people doing systematic reviews outside the clinical trials domain. The other thing I think we can do is just train people better into what the consequences are. Most people regard the consequences of not being inclusive in a review as fairly minor and trivial. And what they don't see is the cumulative nature of this, that if in your paper you only cite a few papers that agree with you, other people will then read your paper and only just pick up on those references and not be aware maybe that there's a whole host of other things. And this does affect the users of research and other scientists. And it affects the funders, because if we start building up an impression of a solid body of work when it's not there, you get to this point of where you get these so-called falsely canonised ideas, ideas which we think are ones that we can just accept without further research, when in fact they're built on a very flimsy background. And the best thing, I think, as well, when training people is to engender a mindset of organised scepticism. And this is a classic uh, term from Merton, who did sociology of science, years back ago in the 1940s um, and it's this idea that you have to be critical of yourself and there are examples of famous science who, scientists who promoted this perhaps the nicest one which I happened upon just reading Darwin's letters um, was this one which I thought he's a really very amazing man because he was so aware of confirmation bias and what he said was I had also during many years followed a golden rule Namely, that whenever a published fact, a new observation or thought came across me, which was opposed to my general results, to make a memorandum of it, without fail and at once. For I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from the memory than favourable ones. So if Darwin says you should do this, you should do it. What's another reason, though, for the problems that we're in? Um... This is really coming down again to this famous phrase p-hacking, which was a term invented in psychology to cover the idea that people will analyse their data in many different ways until they can find something that looks significant and then report that. Um, but in general, there's a lot of false positive results that arise because people misapply statistical methods and often don't really realise what's wrong with that. Um, the key problem is that people will often treat a p-value as an indicator of the importance of a finding, 
without taking the context into account. And to show you what can happen, this is just 16 variables simulated um, from, a from a population with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And I'm going to say these are, say, different compounds that are, that are being tested to see if they improve memory in rats, and there's an improvement score. So the expectation would be that they should all be around zero. But some of them um, are actually well away from zero, and in particular you can notice G and J, which if you test them on a t-test to see if their the scores are higher than zero, they are indeed significantly higher. And so what many people would do at this point is to say, well, those two compounds are important, we're going to focus on them and possibly take them forward to the next step. But the statistics here are quite wrong, because I haven't approached this problem by saying, I'm interested in G and J. I've approached it by saying, are any of these compounds, 16 compounds, effective? And if, so the, the null hypothesis is that none of them are effective. The probability of that being the case is 0.95, is the probability of showing the true null, to the power of 16, which is around 0.4. So the probability of finding something significant just by chance, if you look at 16 things, is a whacking great 0.6, more than 50% chance of finding something if you look at enough things. So this is massively problematic and people underestimate how problematic it is. And then what people will do often is just not to report the things that were not significant and you end up with uh, not really realising that the context was that they were looking at this, these results in the midst of tonnes of other analyses and so you don't detect the fact that p-hacking has occurred and you over overvalue those results. And there's terrific pressures on people to p-hack because, as I'll say more about later on, null results are seen as boring, damaging to your career. If you get a big grant and you find nothing, uh, it's seen as a terrible you know, a problem for a scientist. So most of us, I, mean, I, take, you know, I myself have been in this position, you gather a huge amount of data over a period of often years, and then you come to look at it and, you know, you don't really find what you'd hoped to find, so you start digging about in it. And there's a famous, uh, a famous joke that some of you may have heard of, of a child who was uh, expecting a nice present for their birthday, and when they came down, what, all they found was a great heap of horse manure, but being an optimistic child, they started shoveling around saying, well, with all that shit, I must be a pony in here somewhere. And often researchers are looking for the pony in their data and are determined to find a pony and find any way possible to generate a pony. And this leads to a particular form of p-hacking in many, many areas, which involves a sort of shifting of goalposts, where you start with this big red star, somebody finds something significant, and note the grey blobs are similar studies that fail to find that effect. But you focus on the one that found it, you think, great, and you try and replicate it. But actually what happens is you don't quite replicate it. But what you find is something similar. So you may find the effect only in women, or you may find the effect on a related compound, or whatever it is you're looking at. Um, so you get all these different things coming off that, that, that themselves then lead to further research, which again is going to just slightly shift the goalposts fiddle around in the data until something is found, look at enough things until they find something. And so what you end up with is a, the impression, and I think this is what happened with that depression set of studies, you think there's a large body of confirmatory work, but on the one hand, inconsistent findings have just been disregarded, often with publication bias playing a part, and then if the original finding wasn't replicated, you p-hack until you find something a bit similar. And it looks, uh, if you go back to the literature on, on serotonin genes and depression, as if that's exactly what happened. You get very few direct replications of those initial key findings, but you get sort of things that are broadly related. So the solution to p-hacking, what is it? Well, I would argue you have to train people to use simulation um, in order to understand the problems of p-hacking and how serious they are. I think most people just don't get it. And probability is a slippery and difficult concept. So I'll refer you to my little uh, set of slides that I have available on SlideShare. And here's a sort of example of the thing you can do. You can simulate all these independent variables. So I've said, you know, we're simulating variables where the true correlation between them is zero. 
Um, and we then look at the pattern of intercorrelation between them. And I've shown in red anywhere the correlation is significant at 0.05 without any correction. And so in the first set of first run, I find this a significant correlation between V1 and V3. And then in this next slide, um, you can see we've actually managed to get six significant correlations, some positive, some negative. Um, so how can this happen when we have set this simulation up so there is no relationship between variables? Why are we getting these significant values? Well, um, it's quite simple. It's because we're looking actually on each one. It's just like the problem I showed you before with all the, the rats and the compounds. We're actually looking at 21 correlations on each run. If we use P less than 0.05, we're likely to find one significant value on each run. And we should actually be using a corrected p-value, in this case 0.002. And if we do that, we find that in only 120 runs, do we actually find any significant correlations by chance? But if people start to run these sorts of simulations and see how easy it is to get deceptive data, they begin to understand what the problem is in, in a way that doesn't work if you just get them to read statistics books. A related problem in the other direction is uh, low statistical power, where again people misunderstand statistics. Um, and this time the problem can go in the other direction. You may have a genuine effect that you miss because you're not adequately powered. Um, this is just one example of, of a study that, where somebody surveyed the field, uh, looking at review articles to see how well-powered studies were in the social and behavioural sciences between 1960 and 2015. Um, and this is Smaldino and McCreel-Reith's uh, very nice paper, which covers a whole host of interesting topics. And what you can see is that the average power is just above 0.2, which means that we're spending time and money doing studies that have about an 80% chance of missing a true effect. They assume that an effect size here, quite a small effect size of 0.2. The bigger the real effect in, in the world, the, the higher, the, the smaller the sample you can get away with. Most of the time we're looking at quite small effects. So again, simulation can help people really understand this. So here uh, is simulated data um, from two groups where there's a genuine difference in the population that the samples are drawn from with an effect size of 0.3. And we've got two groups of, of 20. And um, the blue, there's a blue group uh, which has a mean of 0 and a pink group which has a mean of 0.3 in the population they're drawn from. But as you can see by the little stars, there's only actually three occasions when we have a significant difference between those two groups. The black bar showing the mean um, is often very similar for the two groups when you've got samples this small, um, and even occasionally seems to be going in slightly the wrong direction. That can happen with small samples. And again, if you've been through the exercise of generating data like this, you have a much more realistic feeling about why power is important because you know what the truth is you in a sense have been made god you know what the reality is in the world uh, and you can generate data from that knowledge and then see how your statistics behave so simulation is very highly recommended but i want to now turn to a very different type of problem which comes from the incentive structure that we're working within um, and the tendency for both funders and journals to be obsessed with novelty um, and it's related to the obsession with results that are significant. Uh, the two go hand in hand. So the last thing these people like is anything that is either not novel or not significant. There's problems caused by journals. I've blogged about this a lot because I've, I've been a victim of this. Um, they like newsworthiness and a, a methodologically weak study will get published in a journal when uh, a methodologically strong study with a non-significant result is regarded as uh, uh, boring and uninteresting. So I blogged here about a, a, a study published in Current Biology that claimed to show that watching video games improve children's reading. Um, they just won't publish negative findings, and yet they'll publish all sorts of weird and wacky positive findings that were very counterintuitive. Um, there was papers on the amygdala size or, or activity in Christians and atheists in, in one, on one occasion, or political beliefs affecting amygdala activation. Um, and then, again, they will not publish replications most of the time. There was a wonderful quote the other day on Twitter that uh, somebody in PNAS said they weren't a clean-up journal, they weren't going to publish a replication study, or, or indeed a study that failed to replicate a result. You should send it somewhere else. 
we're not a clean-up. So this is a real resistance to publish the sort of work we actually need published. And then if you look at grants panels, I've been published, I've been um, funded by both uh, European Research Council and the Wellcome Trust, to whom I am immensely grateful. But nevertheless, if you look at their guidelines, there's this sort of tendency to want uh, what in the ERC's terms they talk about groundbreaking high risk projects. Welcome sort of said is your pro proposal just a direct continuation of existing work. This implies that work that is cumulative and really sort of may take 10, 20 years to get to the bottom of a problem is not valued. And I despair about this because I think a lot of the time we do need to be doing the basic sort of research and I blogged about this. Um, talked about prospecting for kryptonite and there's this picture that you may um, imagine that there's a, this amazing sub, um, substance kryptonite that we desperately need uh, but we don't know where to find it and there's huge areas of desert where we have to look for it and so we need people to go out and dig up and prospect for it. Um, is it pointless if you don't find any kryptonite? Well it's disappointing because what we all want is kryptonite and you've spent time and energy. But it's actually useful if you end up with a big map that shows you where the kryptonite is and where it isn't. Because otherwise, people will come behind you and start looking again in the place where you were looking. And so it is important to document what doesn't work as well as what does work. And I feel that in contemporary science, we have this sort of problem that people don't report their failures, so other people repeat those failures. Um, and we don't value people who do work even if it's extremely well done, unless it leads to a pos very positive result. So this focus on groundbreaking, novel, transformational science can, I think, be the enemy of high-quality cumulative science. Um, and uh, I've likened it to frogs on a lily pond, who uh, you, find, you make a discovery and then you hop off to the next topic and the next topic, and people don't sort of really settle down and really shore up findings of interest whereas what we actually need is scientists working more like termites where you build a fine structure this impressive termite mound by just lots of people cumulatively working together and really finding out what is the case but that sort of model isn't favored by the current funding systems so i think what are the solutions here well i think uh, meta science studies really pointing out to funders what is happening to their money might be helpful here, and I think they are beginning to take this on board. I did this little analysis just over the weekend um, to really see how expensive was that depression and serotonin genes literature to generate. And this is just funding from NIH, for, and I looked for the keywords serotonin and gene and depression, and fortunately NIH has this wonderful NIH reporter where you can just search for grants on a topic and it'll tell you how much was spent. And what you see was it was pretty low and then it started taking off after a paper by Lesh, which had a lot of citations, it started going up a bit. Uh, a paper by Caspi uh, in 2003 uh, was followed by a further increase and then Bizarre was these are the three most highly cited papers on this topic in Web of Science and then it took off explosively. Um, to the tune that we were for a period of years spending 80 million a year, 80 million dollars a year on, on this research. It then started to come down a bit, but the total cost over this entire period was 1,038 million dollars. Uh, so if you say to funders, you know, that's a lot of money, you could have spent it on something more useful if we trapped earlier on that this was not such re reproducible work. The other thing I think that is useful to consider is, is the publication habits of Nobel laureates. And again, this is a little off-the-cuff analysis that I did because I was delighted to find this data set of publication records for Nobel laureates and scientific data. And I just looked at the mean publications per year over the period when they were publishing for scientists who subsequently got, who, who were awarded Nobel laureates. And what is fascinating is that the median in physics is one paper a year, in medicine, it's two papers a year, and in chemistry, it's two papers a year. And there's a bit of a tail. There's some people who are more productive. But there's a lot of people who get Nobel Prizes. And when you look at their lifetime publications, it's not massive. Um, it's, it's really characteristic of peop uh, these people that they are tending to focus on one problem and really digging in and finding the answer. And this has become a very difficult model to sustain. Um, finally, the Im impression... I have, and I've been trying to look for data on this, is that the duration of research funding has got shorter and shorter, except for a few lucky individuals, and I have been a lucky individual in that regard. 
Um, so researchers have this sort of rather precarious and insecure existence because what you need to do good research is money and a supportive environment, but you also need time. There's hyper-competition for funds, so much time is spent writing grant proposals, and the funding periods are relatively short. People don't have time to think or develop ideas. I, was, I thought I should, since I'm speaking at a Max Planck Institute, I should sort of put in a good word for the model that the Max Planck Institutes offer, um, which is <coughs> very much to give people longer periods, uh, and certainly Max Planck directors, the opportunity to develop their own research programme without too much bureaucracy and without uh, and over long periods of time. Um, but different funders behave differently, and I think it's worth comparing the effectiveness of different models. But the current model of, you know, you can apply for a two- or three-year fellowship as a postdoc and then you move on to another one is very bad, I think, for science. But it's the, com it's the result of there being too many people searching too few funds. Now, I don't want to end on too negative a note. I think there is cause for hope. Uh, funders and institutions are beginning to think about different ways of assessing researchers. I think they're getting more and more concerned about problematic research and wanting to foster research integrity. And I could give a, an entire talk just on the Hong Kong principles, but I, I very much encourage people to look at them because it's a completely new way of assessing people that focuses much more on high quality, open, reproducible research rather than just evaluating people by the results that they've got or their grant income. And I think this is a huge step in the right direction, but I don't think it addresses this problem of not having sufficient time to work in this sort of open and reproducible way. So I think we need to consider how that could also be done. Funds. So, to sum up, um, I first became really involved with reproducibility, uh, I've been interested in it for many years, but I first became really involved in this uh, symposium by the Academy of Medical Sciences, and I can recommend the report that came out of this. But the point that they that came out of a report trying to review the, the terrain was that we'd have these top-down and bottom-up uh, solutions to the problems that we've got. We need, on the one hand, top-down to change the incentive structure, but in also bottom-up, we need much better training in methods and understanding of things like probability. And at that point, um, I'll draw to a close because I want to leave some time for questions. Thank you.